Welcome back, everybody. This is part two of binding your quilt. And the very first part of the actual binding process is squaring up your quilt, which we covered in part one. So you could check out that video somewhere. Um, and <laughs> so part two is actually cutting your binding strips and there are many different sizes and by that probably like four or five different sizes that you can cut your binding strips for the average quilt. Everyone has their personal preference depending on if you hand bind or machine bind. One of the things that we use in quilting is a double fold binding. It does not have to be biased. So traditionally when people think of a binding, they're thinking of a strip that is folded twice. So you have the raw edges folded to the center and then you fold that in half. From there, you would wrap this around your project and in one single stitch, stitch along both pieces um, or both the top and bottom edge and catch hopefully both. And then you would be done with one stitch around your quilt. The problem with this or why I don't use this method is there is only one single layer of fabric that covers that actual outside edge of your quilt. The binding is the most worn part on any quilt and so I want the most security and the most long lasting binding that I can get. That would mean this would not be it. So traditionally quilters will take and fold their binding strip in half running the length of their binding. And then you will sew that to your quilt and flip that around the edge. That means that there are two layers of fabric on that outside edge, which gives me the most durability and the longest wear for my binding. The next thing that I would consider is what width you want to cut your strips. The average for most quilters is two and a half inches, and that's what this is here. If I just have a plain border, then I'm fine and I like two and a half inches. It has the most wiggle room when it comes to putting it on by machine. Um, and so a two and a half inch strip, it's easy to work with. Most of your binding tools that you would find to help like sandwich that last seam are gonna be cut for a two and a half inch bind. And that's great um, if I'm doing something that doesn't have like points on the end of my quilt. And so I'm gonna bring an example of why that would matter. So this is a quilt that just had a solid border. And so when I fold that binding over, so it was stitched to the back and then I fold it to the front, you can see on the back here that I have just about a quarter of an inch there. When I fold it over, there's a little bit more than a quarter of an inch of the binding on the front. And that's great for my machine binding. I personally do a machine stitch and that will show in a few videos. Two and a half inches is really great for machine binding when you're doing it this way. If I'm stitching something by hand, then I don't really need that excess width to it. The other place that I don't want that excess width is in this quilt that we'll be binding here today. So if I have more than a quarter of an inch wrapping around, then I'm gonna lose my points on this pieced border. And then what's the point of putting all that work and effort into a quilt just to cut off my points at the very end. So in today's, I'm gonna be cutting my binding to be two inches because that's actually a very like exact quarter inch. If I wanted to, I could cut my border two and a quarter inches. That's still just a little bit wide for me. You can do two and an eighth is the next size down. I'm gonna stick with a solid two inches because I know that I have a very tight turn on that binding to make. So it will be a very narrow binding. It does take a little bit more work when you are working with such a narrow piece of material. Do take that in mind when you're choosing the size of binding that you're going to cut. The tools that you would need for cutting are obviously gonna be a cutting mat, a rotary cutter, I use a marking utensil, a easy to work with straight edge, and I personally use a pair of scissors as well. I have my excess backing. You can use yardage, you can use 
your excess backing, you can buy pre-made bindings, whatever your preference may be. The next thing we're gonna discuss is how many strips I need to cut. And that's gonna be determined by the width of my fabric and the size of my quilt. I'm gonna first determine the dimensions of my quilt and I leave mine folded in half to measure. You can do it however you please. And I'm actually gonna fold this once more just for ease. If you're measuring air on the side of measuring it for a higher number than a lower. So that is 18 and 19 inches times 4, 76. My other side. And this is exactly 18. So that's going to be 72. I can do that in my head, guys. Don't worry. So my quilt is 72 by 76. So the very first thing I'm going to do when it comes to determining my number of strips is to find out the total linear inches of the exterior of my quilt. In order to determine the total number of linear inches of my quilt, I took the length twice, add it to the width twice, and so that was 296 inches for my quilt. I will then add an extra 20 inches. That's going to be the like joining my bindings, turning my corners, and that extra little bit that I need to overlap. It's just that grace that I wanna have for myself so that I don't run short on binding. So for me, that left me at 316 linear inches of binding that I need. I will divide that by 42 because that is the width of fabric for a standard bolt of cotton fabric. And that's what most quilters use for their binding. So that leaves me with 7.5 strips. I will round up every single time because you do not want to run short. So I rounded up, that left me with eight strips of binding. So then to determine how much binding you need to purchase, you will take the total number of strips needed and multiply it by the width of strip that you want to cut. So I need eight strips at two inches wide. That would leave me with 16 inches of like yardage purchased from the store for my binding. So the other way that you can determine the number of strips that you need, and I'm sure there's multiple apps out there. This is just the one that I use, and that is the quilting calculator. So this is from Robert Kaufman. I use this app on a very regular basis when I'm being particularly lazy, um, and you just open it up and it has binding. So I touch binding, it asks me the width of the fabric. So you can put in, I put in 42, just cause that's what I found to be safe these days. The binding strip width, it has your averages here of two, two and a quarter, two and a half, two and three quarters. I'm gonna do two. And then the dimensions of the quilt. So my quilt is 76 by 72. And we hit calculate. And this tells me I need eight strips and it asks for a half a yard of fabric. The really, really easy way to do things um, where you don't have to have any math is to use your excess backing as your binding strips. I did not have any more of my navy material, otherwise that's probably what I would have chosen. Um, and because this project is close to 10 years old, I just wasn't even gonna go on a hunt for it. Um, so I'm using this medium blue and that will still look nice. I'm not really worried um, about it complementing because I know for sure that it will. The nice thing about using your backing is ideally you will have an extra um, amount of your backing running the whole width of your quilt. So I typically have at least four inches extra on every single side of my quilt for it to be long arm. So top, bottom, left and right side, I've always got excess fabric. So typically that means I have enough that I can use that for binding if I needed to. If I take one strip from the top and one strip from the bottom, one strip from each side, then I know that I have enough length because obviously it was enough to back my quilt. So that means four strips of fabric, less piecing that you have to do and less math. This, because I am cutting two inch strips, I believe I'll be able to get that here. We'll lay my ruler on it um, in just a moment and see. 
But the very first thing I wanna do is square up one edge. The more folds you have in your piece of fabric when you're cutting, the more potential to have a bow in that fabric. So I have one single fold on my fabric here. This, there's two layers, so that means two folds. And so I will line up on this side here because I have two folds versus one fold here. Um, so I'm gonna just pick a line on my ruler and line it up with that fold. And then I wanna leave myself enough where I'm cutting off from all four layers there. The next thing I want to look at is make sure that width wise, I can at least get the width of the strip that I want. So I want two inches. I would be able to get that from this cut. I would not be able to get two and a half because I would run shy on that strip there. So I'm just going to cut and a good habit to be in is to not move your ruler until you've moved your scraps because inevitably you'll have one little missed cut and then you have to try and line your ruler right back up to where it was in order to catch that piece. Now I'm gonna take and measure two inches for me from that cut. Again, I'm lining up my ruler on that bottom fold and then I'm lining it up running the length of this cut. And so by doing that, I'm getting a very nice square cut. I shouldn't have that bow to my fabric. So I will cut here. And this will be scrap. So this is one 76 inch roughly with the fabric. And so I need at least one more this length. And then I need at least two running the actual width of my quilt. This is what I cut off when I squared my quilt. First thing you wanna do is try and line up that grain. You can see I have a very warped edge here. So I would line up the grain of my fabric more so than lining up my edges because I don't have very straight edges here. So with that, when I line it up, I don't wanna have any like fabric pulling in one direction or the other. So I'm gonna take and press this really quick. It is always worth a press. This fabric has a kind of vintagey feel to me, but it's in keeping with the quilt. The quilt block for this is called a granny square. Um, and this is just kind of the sort of fabric I would expect to see on a quilt like this. You don't want like to fold it where you have Definitively, this is the grain of my fabric running here. I don't wanna fold that at an angle where it's going counter to the grain of the fabric pieces below it. So I just wanna try and keep that grain lined up when I'm folding. So now that that's pressed, I'm gonna again, start by squaring up one side and I'm gonna make sure I'm cutting through all of my layers. So I have one, two, three, and we're missing one layer, which means I need to scoot over. Oh, there it is. I'm cutting this excess off. That's my scrap. And now we'll just see how many pieces I can get from this. That's not creepy. So with this, I actually potentially may be able to get all the rest of my strips from this. Obviously, you'll want to get as many strips from one piece as you can. That's less work for you. That's more usable yardage left in one piece with your other excess backing. And so the one thing I'm noticing here is I did not quite get through all four layers. You can see how that ended there. So I wanna come and cut this off here where that doesn't meet two inches, just cause I don't wanna accidentally sew that to something. So I'm just gonna hack that off there cause this was a fifth and extra strip anyway. 
Is it time for a good stereotypical husband joke? Like, he's good for something, guys. He takes my scrap. <laughs> so this is my binding strips. The only other thing that I want to just show you and discuss is the ways that you can cut bias binding. Bias binding is lovely. If you have a stripe, it makes beautiful bias binding because you're instead of having that stripe going vertically, when you cut it across that, it just adds a lot of movement to the edge of your quilt. Plaids work really great as bias binding as well for that same reason. If you have any sort of curve in your border, so a scalloped border, if you do rounded corners, you 100% need to do a bias binding. You will not get a clean, smooth binding if you don't. I'm making baby doll quilts, as you possibly know. And this is going to be the binding for one of my baby doll quilts. And so I would like to cut it on bias. And that's great, because then you can see how I will go about doing that. So when you are cutting bias binding, you do not have a fold in your material. And I will repeat that once more. When you are cutting a bias binding, you do not leave your fabric folded. So I will open it up so I have the full width of my fabric. This is just a fat quarter because I didn't need much for my baby doll quilts. So when I'm cutting my binding, I will start by squaring up the length of my quilt. So your selvage is obviously going to be square. You need to cut running that length square to that. I'm using any line on my ruler and we're going to square that edge up. So now that I have a square edge, I'm going to use one of the lines on my ruler. So my ruler has a 45 degree line and it has a 60 degree line. What we're doing is cutting against the grain of this material. So your fabric has a grain and it's called the warp and the weft. And what that is, is the direction that when one thread is wove into the other, it's typically rather um, sturdy with cotton fabrics. So I don't have a ton of give when I stretch with the grain that direction. And I don't have a ton of give when I stretch with the grain this direction. When you stretch on the bias, you can see that that puts a lot more stretch in there. What we're gonna do is cut a bias line running counter to the grain of that material. That bias allows you to stretch this around a curve. It's also gonna be on hems and necklines, sleeves um, and like shoulder seams that you would put this bias tape if you're doing garment construction because for that same reason, it allows it to stretch. Cutting across the grain is gonna be cutting at a 45 degree line. So my roller has that in two places. I'm gonna start by lining that 45 degree line up with my piece of fabric here. Then I will cut on that line. When I get here, I'm going to gently fold this back and again, you can see I didn't quite cut right at that tip and if I move my ruler, then it would be harder to get back there. So if I fold that back, I need to extend my ruler just slightly here. And so I'm going to keep that line of my ruler lined up with my cut. So I will continue that cut the remainder of the way. This is a very stretchy edge. So you want to handle these strips with care because you don't want to stretch them now in the cutting process. I can stack these on top of each other now. So I'm gonna line up these two strips, one on top of the other. You'll proceed forward just like cutting any other strips, except now I'm just going at an angle. The very smallest that I would ever get as far as yardage goes when it comes to doing a binding would be a half of a yard. Even if you only need like three eighths of a yard or something to bind your project, it is better to have that extra width because you will have so many seams in your quilt. If it's a table runner and you wanna do 
a stripe binding for that table runner and you only need four strips, I will still get a half of a yard because that determines the number of strips you have to piece together. So this will seam onto here and it's relatively blind when you do seam that. Um, and so you don't notice it as much, but if I had that here and here, because my um, width of my material was only like 12 inches, it's just no fun. Um, so at minimum, I cut my bias strips at a half inch wide. So, so my strips are gonna be different lengths as well. Once I get to this end, I'm obviously gonna have some shorter strips. I intersperse those. So I like to do a long strip, a short strip, a long strip, a short strip. And then if I know I have some extra, I'll just put like three or four short strips at the end in hopes that I'll be cutting those off. It really depends on if you know that you need all your strips, then I would intersperse them rather than keeping all your short pieces together and then like having all your long pieces together. You could pattern match if you were doing something like this. I potentially would, um, but probably not because this is such busy fabric that if you have it here or here or here, you're not gonna really like be able to pick out and say like, oh, those two yellow lines are a lot closer than the other two yellow lines. That's really not something that's gonna bother me all that much. Um, you could pattern match if it's something that you think would bother you absolutely take the time it's worth doing then today this there is no definitive pattern to match so we're just going to join our strips you will sew on the bias or on a diagonal when you are joining your binding strips and i will show you why so if i seamed this with just a straight seam and then press that even pressing it open so if i press that open then I have two layers of fabric here and two layers here. When we go to actually apply this to our quilt, we will press that in half. So we're just gonna work with one so we can see that. So when I press that in half, I now have four layers of material here. That is going to get sewn to the edge of my quilt. So everywhere that I would have a seam, I will then have four layers in that one place and then my layer of backing, batting, and quilt top. That's not too bad, but once I flip this over and flip that over again, I now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 layers of fabric right there and my batting. And that's just a very thick area on your quilt. So what we do for quilting when we're joining our binding strips is sew them on a diagonal. If I were sewing on a diagonal, I would have that excess cut out and then this would be my seam pressed there. So when I fold this over, I, instead of having my bulk all right on top of one another, my bulk is here and here. And then when you wrap this around the quilt, the excess bulk is in the middle. So my bulk is spread through the whole of that fold as opposed to being stacked one on top of the other. So let's go through how to do that. All I'm gonna do is take and lay right sides together, one of my fabrics down, the other fabric up, and then I eyeball where that corner and this corner meets. If I'm not eyeballing it, then you can draw your line. So I would draw my line from corner point to corner point where those meet. So this is a friction pen. It's gonna erase with the heat of my iron. And that would be my stitch line. With material that has definitive right and wrong sides, it's pretty easy to keep this lined up. The challenge is if you're working with solids, then those are sometimes hard to determine which side is the right and wrong side. And so you can end up with a seam on one side and then you go down your strip and your seam is flipped and it's on the outside now and you would have that seam showing on your quilt. So it's very important to make sure that you have the same sides 
always together. So when I'm working with solids, I take and follow that strip all the way through to the end. And I would lay this knowing, okay, that's my right side. I will put my next piece on top of it and I would pin it from there just so I can help keep track of sewing the right same side together. So solids are the only slightly challenging thing when you are piecing your own binding. I'm gonna close my blade and then we're gonna go sew this together. And we're back. So now that I have all my strips sewn together, I chain piece them so it makes it really easy to find those ends. And I need to cut off all that excess and my dog ears. So you could do this using a ruler. So I'm gonna cut this apart and show you that way. So I could just line up my quarter inch line on my ruler with that seam line and cut. Doing it this way, I then still have my dog ears here to cut off like so. I do it the slightly lazy way. I come and eyeball it and I cut up a little, cut across approximately a quarter inch and cut down. And that cuts those dog ear pieces off in one big piece so I don't have a bunch of little triangles. And this is relatively easy to me. I just find this to be a very efficient way of doing it. And so it's how I do most of my bindings. This, if it is not a perfect quarter inch seam inside your binding, no one's going to notice. This isn't getting joined to another block that has to be like perfectly matched up. So for me, this is not a problem at all. So I will add that scrap to my scrap pile. And now we get to the pressing. Why are you being so creepy? From here, all I'm gonna do is press this in half, running the whole length of my binding. My binding is pressed and ready to be applied to my quilt. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I hope you've learned something. If you have any tips or tricks or better ways that you like to make your binding strips, please send them my way. I love learning new things and I'm sure our viewers would as well. So we hope to see you next time for stitching my binding to my quilt. Thanks. Yeah, a little bit louder. There you go.